Good morning, Citywide Church. Who's fired up to be at church on this Sunday morning? Yes. Oh, I love the energy in the room. I'm fired up to be with you. My name is Joe Sango. I really hope you're making plans to join us today for the financial learning experience. Uh, it is going to be so helpful. I promise you, even if you're not struggling with money, I guarantee you, you know someone who is. And uh, we have over 100 free financial tools we want to place in your hands and equip you to take spiritual principles and make them living and active in your life. I'm so excited to be with you today. Let me tell you a little bit about who I am, then we'll dive into the message. My name is Joe Sangle. I'm the youngest of six boys. My mother and father had four boys. They really wanted a daughter. And uh, my mother went into labor an hour and a half before April Fool's Day at March 31st. And uh, the nurse was listening in the womb, got a really scared look and went and got a doctor and said, there's something wrong with the baby's heartbeat. Uh, and the doctor came in and he listened and he broke into a big smile and said, there's nothing wrong with the baby's heartbeats. There's two of them. And that, my friends, is the moment my mother realized she was having twins. And so my identical twin was born about an hour before April Fool's Day. And seven minutes later, I was born. So I do have a clone. And so I've grown up life with an identical twin. And so I'm the baby of the family by seven minutes. And my mother said, the Lord has spoken. If we try to have a girl again, we'll have triplet boys. We are through with this. And so we're the youngest of six, grew up just south of Indianapolis, Indiana. I went to Purdue University and studied mechanical engineering, got a degree in that barely. Uh, some people graduated with special honors like magna cum laude and summa cum laude. I graduated with lesser known honors called thank the laude and got out of there. I had a 2.64 GPA. Uh, did anybody graduate that way? And so be glad I'm not engineering anything. It would harm someone, I'm sure. But I took a job transfer to South Carolina. And while I was there in 1998, I ended up running into a person who had a call of God on his life to plant a church. And that's where I found God's call in my life. And I helped plant a church. And we went live January 16th, 2000. And in the course of the next 10 years, God grew it to be the second largest church in the United States. With over 33,000 people attending in person across 14 campuses in South Carolina. It's incredible. You can look it up. It's New Spring Church. And I ended up being on staff with that church. And God birthed in me this passion to teach stewardship. We realized that there's a fundamental fact that people struggle with money. How many of you have bought the book, How to Be Broke in Five Easy Steps? Anybody buy that book? See, we figure it out on our own. And let me tell you why. It's because we have an enemy. And if he can keep us broke, he can keep us focused on ourselves self-focused, selfish, instead of being selfless and having our heads lifted up and dreaming. Here's one thing I know when I go teach high school students, they still dream. They dream big. But as soon as the money enters the equation, they stop dreaming. It robs them of dreaming if they're not careful. And so I encourage you today uh, to have the ears open and take the wall of resistance down. I know I'm talking about money. And as they shared in the announcements, we get funny when it comes to money, don't we? Yeah. But here, I want you to know, I'm going to do a little bit of preaching and a whole lot of teaching. Amen. And I'm going to share my story, my testimony, because as the youngest of six, I grew up in a household where we went six people, kids, two parents, one bathroom. Get the picture. In a very small house. And uh, I was the first to go to college. And frankly, I went to college to avoid working. The guidance counselor at my high school said, fill out this application to Purdue. It's free. And I could have, I could afford free. So I filled it out. And seven days later, I had an acceptance later. And when I went to college, I had no money. So how do you think I paid for college? I started dating this girl named Sally May. Does anybody know her or her first cousins? Nelnet, Navient, Federal Direct Loans, AES. Anybody know them? It was awesome. They'd let me sign my name and they would let me stay. And then I, my first weekend, they offered me credit cards. And so I filled out all the applications. They gave me a free two liter of Coca-Cola, a free t-shirt and a duffel bag from American Express. And even though I admitted truthfully on paper that I had no job and no income, guess what showed up in the mailbox about a week later, a credit card. And I didn't have that wisdom from that kid's show that says swiper. No swiping. Come on, Vominos. Everybody, let's go. 
I started swiping away and really quickly I had a balance and I graduated from college, but I didn't graduate from my debt. And I had tens of thousands of dollars of student loan debt, thousands of dollars of credit card debt, but I hadn't learned my lesson because watch this. I don't know if it's true for you, but I had had zero classes about managing money. I grew up going to church a lot as a kid. I don't know if you did, but my mother with six boys, she decided to go to church every time the doors were open. Sometimes when they weren't, we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night was youth service. And she suggested we go, but I had zero messages taught about money. I had messages about giving, but giving's like 10, 15% of this thing. And so consequently, I only knew how to do one thing with money. What was that? Spend it. And I had a talent for that. I had the spiritual gift of making money disappear. Does anybody have that gift? Jesus, you see these hands. We pray for deliverance. I graduated from college and I bought a new car. I even financed a sales tax, 105% financing for a car. I bought a truck, 100% financing. Moved to South Carolina with a job transfer and somehow bought a house and financed the furniture 24 months, same as cash. Asked my college sweetheart to marry me and we financed the wedding on the credit card, the honeymoon to Jamaica and all on the credit card. And at this moment, no one is saying, I perceive this speaker to be a financial genius. You're saying, help him, Lord. Others are saying, that reminds me of my story. But here's what I would tell you. A moment came where I realized this was not honoring the Lord and it was not honoring the dreams he had placed in my heart. Has anybody ever had that moment? And so today, as we're continuing in this sermon series of first, I want to talk about first in our finances. We all remember first in our lives. Do you remember maybe the first time you drove a car? Do you remember the first time you drove a car? What type of car was it? Name it. Somebody said, you go. <laughs> I drove a 1981 Datsun B210. Get fired up. It went forever on a thimble full of gas, but it was special. Do you remember eating an unusual food? Hmm. Maybe it was a one and done thing. Maybe you remember the first time you visited a faraway city. Maybe it's the first time you went to your favorite destination. Disney World comes to mind. Maybe it's the first time you went to a sporting event. I remember the first time I ever went to a sporting event. It was my Cincinnati Reds. They played the Pirates and we lost. I remember going out on my first date. Anybody remember that? Maybe that first kiss. I remember the first time my baby walked on her own. We remember first because some of these first impact us so deeply that we return to experience it again and again. We love it so much. And we remember financial first. Maybe it's that first time you got a paycheck. Anybody remember your first paycheck? And you're introduced to this weird critter named FICA. And you're like, who is FICA? They took a bunch of my money. And then somebody told you it was social security. And then you saw taxes. And you're like, I want to vote. When can I vote again? And you want to vote every Tuesday, less taxes. And then maybe you remember buying that first car. You know, that was big stuff. Adulting, the young people call that now. Or purchasing a home. Anybody remember buying a first home? And you're signing your name to that mortgage and it says, I'm going to pay how much? And you're like, am I crazy? Or do I have faith? Or do I have crazy faith? I'm not sure at the moment. It's crazy. And so I, I want you to understand this. There are also spiritual financial first. The first time that we work for income, that is spiritual to provide for your household. The first time we return a tithe, has that ever happened for you? Many of you have experienced it. Some of you, you're still kicking the tires on putting the, the Lord first through the tithe. Maybe you remember the first time you chose to save money. Did you know that's spiritual? Have you ever had a moment where you had no money and you had a pile of bills this big and it affected your emotions? See, spiritual 
is it, 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 I got a definition I brought with me. I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. He says it's an adverb, a descriptor, and it says relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul. Have you ever had money affect the human spirit or soul? As opposed to material or physical things. And I want you to know this, that your work is spiritual, that your giving is spiritual, that saving is spiritual, and investing is spiritual when you realize that it's all God's. If it's for yourself, then that could be driven by greed. But if you realize it's the Lord's and your job is to be a wise steward for the Lord's resources, then it's spiritual. And so today I came with some help that really helped me and I pray that it's a help to you. It's an acronym. Some of us like acronyms. Many of you have maybe served in the military. You've learned acronyms. Um, you, you know, the DD-214, when somebody's honorably discharged, you learn all these acronyms. We learn in baseball and ERA. What's that stand for? The earned run average. We go to cars and there's MPG. What's that? Miles per gallon. Uh, we, so there's an acronym. This is a new one. And it's G-S-I-P-T-R. And it stands for Give, Save, Invest plan the rest. Give, save, invest, plan the rest. Now that rhymes if you say it right. So help me say it. Let's say it together. Give, save, invest, plan the rest. We're going to work through this. This transform my finances and how I view them. I pray it will do the same for you. Let's look at give. And in Proverbs 3, 9, it says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. We're in this season of first fruits at Citywide. And, and the word says first fruits a lot. I don't know if you know this. Who grew up with the King James version of the Bible? Who grew up with thou shalt know then that first fruits is mentioned in the King James version 30 times. Who, who likes the ESV edition of the Bible? The ESV, the English Standard Version. It's mentioned 33 times. Who reads the NIV 2011 edition, the NIV? It's mentioned 32 times. I did a word search for the word last fruits or no fruits. How many times is that mentioned in all editions of the Bible combined? Yeah, exactly zero. See, the Lord wants us to put him first. Everybody say first. 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 Every dollar God has given us. Think about this. Every dollar he's given you, every dollar he will give you includes a dime to return to his kingdom work. Do you believe that? Three people believe it. Would I repeat it again? Gladly. Every dollar God has given you and every dollar he will give you in the future includes a dime for his kingdom work. It's his plan to use us. And he, he owns it all. And, and when he, it's his plan for funding the kingdom. And I remember this moment when I was going through this process of wondering, how do I get control of my finances? I realized one of the great things that I needed to recognize was that I am not the owner. In fact, I was looking at my management of the resources he had given me. And I realized I was running a nonprofit organization. So let me ask you. If you are the owner of you incorporated, should you fire you? Yes or no? And I had to fire me because not only was I spending every dollar he had given me, watch this. I was spending more. And then I dared to look at him and say, the problem is you're not giving me enough. Send me more. And if we're being honest, some of us here today have done the same. And you know what the Lord did? He said, I'll test you. I'll give you more. He gave me more, but do you think it transformed how I managed it? It just, it just enhanced the misbehavior. And all of a sudden I had a moment like my mother experienced with her six boys from time to time. And she experienced what I call an I H H E moment. And I have had enough moment. What happened when your mama had enough? Did things stay the same? I can tell you when mama single had enough, she announced it to the whole household. I have had enough. And she whipped out her primary weapon, which was a fly swatter with the metal wire. And she would swing indiscriminately as she approached the perpetrator. 
If you got caught in the crossfire, she was not apologizing. And I had to have that moment with my finances. I remember my moment. I can tell you the day. It was December 2nd, 2002, nearly 22 years ago. And I, I, and I remember sitting in a hotel room with a job transfer. And I had forgotten a fundamental fact that when you leave an employer, they stop paying you. Did you know that? And I didn't know when my new employer was going to pay me. And all of a sudden I realized this has got to change. And for the first time in my life, I surrendered it all to the Lord. All of it. I had surrendered my heart to him, but I did not realize I was holding back this financial thing. And I ran across this verse, Psalm 24, 1, and it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything but money. Is that what it says? The, er the earth is the Lord's and everything that I want him to have. Nope. It says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It's all the Lord's. So my challenge to you today is maybe you've surrendered your heart to the Lord, but have you surrendered the wallet? It's a season of first fruits. Giving. Giving gets your attention. It gets your attention that says Jehovah Jireh is my provider. And when I give, I'm relying on him to continue providing in the future. Jehovah Jireh. The second word is save. Give, save. So let me ask a question. Is it biblical to save? Absolutely. Is it spiritual to save? So let me ask you some questions that lead to that. Does a lack of savings or has a lack of savings ever affected your spirit and soul? Okay. Next question. Do times of famine ever happen? Does COVID happen? Do layoffs happen? Do illnesses happen? Does your young son get bored and run out in the yard and say, hey, watch this, and you get a medical bill? Does the roof leak? Does the appliance fail? Oh, does a car break down? I have a buddy who has a car. I got in, there were three lights on the dash. On. His solution? Post-it notes. He had covered them up. I got out of the car. It broke down shortly thereafter. So let me ask a question. Do you know what Proverbs 21, 20 and 21 says? Let's put it on the screen. The wise, what do they do? They store up. They save. Choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds things that we all desire. Life, prosperity, and honor. So let me ask the question another way. Is it right to spend every dollar God gives us? Of course not. But isn't it hard to save money? It is so hard. And it's because we, you and I, have eyes. And we can see things. And, we, and when we go on Instagram, every third thing is an ad. And they know what you like, so they keep feeding you more of what you like. And you drive down the road and it's on the, on the billboard. And you go in the store and it talks to you. You look at the new cars and they wink at you. At least that's what happens to us spenders. It's hard to save money. Because, watch this, the enemy knows how to tempt us with feelings of envy, of lack, of scarcity, of jealousy, greed, arrogance, pride, selfishness. And if we are not very alert, he will drag us to spiritual ruin. Let's return to the Holy Scripture in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, gives us an observation. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. What does it do? Oh, this goes with the giving talk that was shared today. I love it. It says, it stores its provisions in summer at the right season. And it gathers its food when? At the right time at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. So what can we learn from this? Save in times of abundance. 
Too many people spend it all and then the time of famine shows up and they're like, I need to save. It's too late. Save in times of abundance. On the farm, they said it this way, make hay while the sun shines. The consequences for laziness is poverty and it's quick and it's sudden. Let me tell you what I've learned about saving money. It's not only a huge help to navigate financial obstacles. We've listed them. We all know about the obstacles. But the greater thing that I learned is that savings positions you for opportunities. Have you ever noticed some people seem to have the Midas touch? They constantly get blessed. They're the ones with the deals. Let me tell you something. When I didn't have savings, I couldn't see the deal. It was like blinders were on. But as I prioritized savings and with the Lord's help, we were able to build savings. Suddenly my eyes were open to see stuff. Opportunities. And there are opportunities. I'll just prophesy right now. There are opportunities in front of every one of you right now. You're watching online. It's in front of you right now. But you will not see it until you store up, till you save. Not just so that you can rest, not so that you can build bigger barns, but so that you can stay focused on the mission God has for you. Give, save, and the third word is invest. Proverbs 13, 11 says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little. Who can do little by little? Some can do very little by little, I know. But just little by little, what do they do? They make it grow. This is so good. I grew up around these farms and it was so unique. Um, in the springtime, the farmers would go into the field, large, vast fields, and in the back of a small pickup truck were bags of seed. Right season, right time. And they would plant these seeds. And those, those few bags of seed would plant the entire field. But yet, right season, right timing, fertile soil. They would come back four or five months later. And what took a pickup truck to bring in took semi-trailers to haul out. Compound interest in front of them. Little by little. God made it grow. Did the farmer make that seed grow? Like, like literally you put the seed in the ground. Did you make it grow? Who makes it grow? God. What does it say in the word? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but it is God who is making it grow. And it starts growing and it starts growing and it starts growing. It's a little corn seed spouts up and maybe seven days later, a little green spike. Can you harvest it at that moment? No. Got to let it grow. And it starts growing leaves. It's like leaves are cool. They're in. I'm going to grow another leaf and another leaf. And then suddenly it's like leaves are out, man. I'm going to grow a tassel. And then in between those leaves, here comes an ear of corn. Has those hairs on it that you see on the sweet corn. You know those hairs? Did you know every one of those is a tube that's hollow? And primarily at dusk and at dawn, you can look. If the sun is behind you, you can see the pollen falling from that tassel. And it will fall down and it will capture in the end of those tubes and go down to each kernel. Every tube is connected to each individual kernel. And at that moment when it hits a kernel, it is fertilized. At that moment, it now has potential to grow a plant again. And within six hours, that tube will disconnect from that kernel. And then the plant fills out the seed and then it dies. And the farmer comes, as the Bible says, and lays a sickle to it for the harvest has come. Isn't that crazy? Then you can harvest. Many people plant, but they try to harvest too early. You have to have timing. Right season, timing. Give, save, invest. When you give, watch this, this is beautiful. Giving to God honors him and it's investing in kingdom work. There is a spiritual return on that investment. Citywide, do you know why this place is filled up with people? Do you know why there's so many watching online? Hey, it's not easy to find parking. I, I, I know that. It's not easy to fit in here when we're all crammed in here like this, right? But why are you here? Because the spirit of the Lord has drawn you here. Because the Lord is doing incredible things here. And that's happened. Watch this. Because so many people have invested through their giving dollar. And savings, so important for building margin in your life. And then that investing, the only number that God cannot bless is a zero. 
Many people that I meet are saying, I'm praying for the Lord to bless me abundantly. How much are you investing? None. And I hate to tell them this, but they have a better chance of discovering a magical unicorn in their backyard than they do of getting any harvest. By the way, unicorn is mentioned in the King James Bible nine times. That's a fact. He hath, as it were, an horn of a unicorn. Special Bible study, 3 a.m. service. My 10-year-old daughter loves that. But let me tell you something. When you put just some, just a little, God puts his blessing hand upon it. It's incredible. Psalm 37, 4, uh, it says this. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I have a question for, for those here today. Do you have a desire in your heart that the bank account says no way? Let me ask you a question. Have you started following God's plan of giving, putting him first? Have you started building savings? Yes, for obstacles, but also for the opportunities. And have you invested some? It'll change your life. So Proverbs 13, 12 says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I think one reason why people get stuck in poverty and then generational poverty happens is because hope is deferred and there is no longer hope. But can I just remind someone today, I know the author of hope and and where the Lord is, there is liberty and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And, and, And today I want to restore hope to somebody. To say, if you follow these steps, if you take tentative steps, watch this. Sometimes the steps are this big. That's it. That's it. That's all you can take. But it's a little bit of progress. God can bless it. And as your faith gets filled up, watch what happens. God will move. Investing is God's method for multiplying what he's given you. I I don't know if you remember this in school, but my teacher taught me four primary operators of math. Addition and subtraction, multiplication, division. Here's what I've learned in my financial journey with the Lord. That God tends to operate on the adding and multiplying. Satan tends to operate on the subtracting and the dividing side. Believe it. And ask the Lord to guide your steps, to help you stay focused on him, to trust him, and to put him first. And watch what happens. Here, here's what I know. They're difficult. The giving, saving, investing, they are very difficult to do. They're difficult. They're difficult to do the first time. Can I get a witness? Yes. Giving, saving, investing, I, I found out they're difficult to do the th- second or third time. Anybody a witness? Yes. I've also found that giving, saving, investing can also be difficult the 183rd time you do it. <laughs> because the enemy is relentless. But I will tell you, through my faith journey with the Lord in this way, I have found him faithful, ever present, and moving on my behalf. So so knowing this, let me provide you some practical tips. And we'll final uh, point of plan the rest, we'll address it. But let me give you some practical tips for giving, saving, and investing. Um, Tip number one, pray and read God's word daily. Listen, God's word, it's living and active. And it will work in your life. Go to you version. I, I, I keep streaks, right? They've gamified it. So you can have these streaks of how many days in the road you re- row that you've read God's word. And I was so mad. I got to like 500 days in a row. And I went to a church camp. And they had no cell service. And it didn't record me reading the Bible that day. And it started me over at one. I'm so frustrated. But I'm back up to 55, okay? So here we go. But if you read God's word, there'll be this thing that happens in you first. I do it before I even get out of bed. I call it bread before breakfast. Tip number two, just start. Start with something, anything. The only number that doesn't move you forward, remember, is zero. So, hey, listen, we had a time of giving already today. I gave. I gave where I'm fed. I was fed. I was blessed by this worship team today. I've been blessed as I worked with your team yesterday and the leaders here. And and I invested because this is good ground. It took me like eight seconds because I've already set up push pay. Give something, give a dollar, 
Watch what God starts doing. Start saving. Set up a bank account. If you don't know how to do that, get someone who has one and have them take you. Start investing. If you don't know how, take the group study. We will show you. It is way simpler than you think. And all trading costs are zero now. So it's accessible to anybody. You can invest with as little as $5. Get fired up. You can do that. Tip number three, get wise counsel in your life. Proverbs 15, 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Do you have advisors in your life related to money? See, it's personal finances and many of us take it very personal. It's mine. I know I'm in a mess, but it's my mess. And I will tell you the number one reason why we will not get wisdom counsel It's because of one word, five letter answer, pride and friends, pride will keep you broke. Pride will keep you isolated and pride will allow you to be deceived by the enemy. Hey, you'll find out your friends are broke too. You'll find out your friends didn't know either. And you can go together and grow together. It's incredible. Two other tips and we'll dive into the final point. Tip number four, automate, automate stuff. I mean, it's awesome. You, can you automate your giving? Get fired up. Can you automate your saving? Yes, hallelujah. Can you automate your investing? Yes. Can you automate your exercise? Wouldn't that be awesome? You wake up at 6 a.m. and you're you're climbing off the treadmill. I just did six miles. It was automatic. That'd be awesome. While we work on that, let's automate what we can. It's awesome. And then the fifth tip is financial education. Many people have an academic education. But friends, you can have more degrees than a thermometer and still be broke. If you do not gain financial education, start with God's word. Participate in the financial learning experience today. Be a part of the study and watch what happens. Let's get to our final point. Give, save, invest. What's the last part? Plan the rest. Is this helping anybody? Okay, Proverbs 21.5 says the plans of the diligent lead to what? Profit, as surely as haste, leads to poverty. So which would you rather have? Profit? Poverty. Well, we would all choose profit. And the, and the writer says there's two things that yield profit. Do you see it? Let's see it. The plans of the diligent. What's another word for a financial plan? It's called a budget. Savers, buckle your seatbelts. There's going to be turbulence. A plan. And then you've got to be diligent to follow the plan. Did you know that's a fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, and 23, one of the fruits of the Spirit we all get when we receive the Lord is self-control. Ask the Lord to activate it. I need the Lord's help. I'm a spender. I mean, I go out, spend too much money on lunch and accidentally buy a truck. I, I, I'm serious. Anybody like that? You've got to plan the rest. And so, is anybody here who loves budgeting? Where are my three people who love budgeting? Okay. But we all want to honor the Lord. And so let me tell you, my budgeting has allowed me to do things I never thought possible. I remember this moment when Jen Sangle walked in. I knew she had been praying for her spender husband. And I was watching my beloved Chicago Cubs lose a baseball game which means I was taking a nap. It was on a Sunday afternoon and she said this piece of paper with her handwriting on it. And it said, she's like, Joseph, what do you think of this budget? Well, I'm a spender. What do you think I think of budgets? I I burst into rap poetry. I said, my name is Joe and that budget makes me say no. And that interrupts my flow. So it's got to go. (laughs) Woo! She did not cheer. (laughs) But as an engineer, I realized it could be an Excel spreadsheet. I raced in our computer room and got on a Gateway 2000 computer. I'm old. Anybody remember those? And I put together a budget and watched this for the first time in our life. It was July of 2003. We followed the budget. There was giving first. What do you think was second? Saving. What was third? Investing. And what do you think we did with the rest? We planned it. And that month, we acquired no new debt. And our debt went down a little. And the next month, 
with the Lord's help, we did it again. And the next month, with the Lord's help, we did it again. It was kind of like a diet where you start seeing progress and you get fired up. And 14 months later, we became debt free except for our house. Get fired up. I was fired up. Three years later, I was able to fire myself from corporate America and negotiate myself a 50% pay cut. Get fired up and go on staff at the church I helped start. Hey, listen, there was less cheers with that because the greed has invaded the American church where it's only godly if it's more for me. But listen, I came to tell somebody today, God's positioning you to hear this message so that you can prosper, but with less. And I was able to go into ministry. Oh, so fired up helping people in this area. I was able to coach 650 people myself that year for free, offering them God's word and his help. It was incredible. And God started moving on our behalf. And I felt God compelling me to write a book. So I wrote this book, sent it to publishers. They universally agreed it should not be published. But if God called you to do it. And I went and I got to meet with Dave Ramsey. And I said, I wrote this book. What should I do? He's like, just self-publish it. I'm like, I don't know what that means, but I became an expert in it. Like everybody becomes an expert now. I Googled it. How to self-publish a book. In January 20th, 2008, I released, I was broke, now I'm not. Was there a better time to release a personal finance book? Remember 2008? The 401k had turned into a 201k and then to a box of special K. Can I get a witness? And why I gave away a corporate career and I gave away half my income. God said, watch this. And he sold over $2 million of that book. God's allowed us to build nine businesses. We have a team of 26 people. God has moved greatly on my behalf. And let me tell you something. I am no one special in the kingdom. He loves you as much as he loves me. He can do for you what he's done for me. So let me give you a couple tips and then I'm gonna wrap this up. Tip number one, Ask God for guidance. Pray. You got to pray. Number two, you should write down your God-given plans, hopes, and dreams. Write them down. It's a step of faith to write them down. I'm aware you have big dreams. You've told no other human being. You're scared of them, but you know God gave it to you. You've told your dog, but he keeps good secrets. (laughs) Number three, I challenge you to put time on your calendar every month to budget. Do it. I know it's not exciting, but you'll love the results. Number four, prioritize your giving, saving, and investing in that budget. Tip number five, automate your payments. And number six, establish accountability. Have accountability. Your spouse, if you're married, financial coaching. You can take a picture of this. I'll put it back on the screen during the financial learning experience this afternoon as well. But let me tell you, with the Lord's leading, you can do this first fruits. So here at the start of the year, my big question is, what is your next step? What is your next step? Is it time to put God first in your finances in 2024? Hey, that step of faith, something today, not tomorrow, today. I dare you. I triple dog dare you. I watched that movie six times. Is it it time to prioritize saving? I refuse to buy Peacock to watch the game last night. I'm just not going to do it. It was $5.99, but on principle, I'm not doing it. Maybe this is the year to start investing. Perhaps it's time to embrace budgeting. But listen, I'm speaking to someone right now. You have a bigger issue. You have a debt you can't pay. And that's a debt of sin. And you've never surrendered your life to him. And Romans 10, 9 tells you how you can have that debt removed. It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, that you will be saved. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed, our ministry team's coming forward. Will you have a moment of reflection about your next step? 
I know this can be challenging. But in this moment, in this holy moment, I can feel the Lord here. His spirit is moving. Is he drawing you for salvation? If that is you, you simply have to say a simple prayer. Just as we're instructed in Romans 10, 9, you can say, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I confess you as Lord. I believe that you rose again. Come into my heart. Take complete control. I surrender my life to you. Hey, for others here, it's time to surrender your finances to him. When you got baptized in slow motion, it's as if the wallet was held above the water. It's time to get it baptized too. To surrender it all to him, trusting him. Jehovah Shammah, you are here. Jehovah Jireh, you are the provider. Jehovah Rapha, you are the healer of our hearts, of our health, and of our finances. Hey, in these moments, Lord Jesus, I pray, do what you need to do. Help your people respond. Jesus, we love you. And in your name we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You can move forward in these moments.